British Bank HSBC is responding today to ces révélations concernant la banque britannique HSBC. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories that we've been tracking this week. Swiss banks, tax dodgers, and a multinational reporting effort. The story behind the HSBC story. After 411 days behind bars, bail for Al Jazeera's Mohammed Fahmi and Bahar Mohammed in Cairo. And news that takes its time. We look at the slow journalism movement, including one writer who's taking seven years to tell a story. At exactly 9 p.m. GMT this past Sunday, February 8th, a news story broke on multiple news outlets in many countries. It went online at precisely that moment because that was the deal, the time that journalists from 45 countries agreed to simultaneously publish their reports on what have come to be known as the Swiss leaks. Both the story about tax evasion and the journalistic effort that exposed it occurred on a global scale. This process got its start six years ago, in January of 2009, when an employee turned whistleblower at the British bank HSBC handed over a trove of financial data to the authorities in France. That data reportedly showed that HSBC, the world's second biggest bank, helped thousands of its clients hide money in secret accounts held by its private bank in Switzerland. Then the French newspaper Le Monde got its hands on the data, along with a second leak. Le Monde's editors brought in the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Now, typically, news organizations don't like to share their scoops, but Le Monde needed help. It wanted the consortium to assemble a global reporting team. Given the scale of the story, the number of countries affected, and the political implications, the logic was that the more reporters covering it, with their varied vantage points, the better. This is a story about money. It involves news organizations, most of which are shrinking, teaming up to take on a behemoth in the world of banking. Our starting point this week is Geneva. We've seen journalistic collaborations before. In 2010, it was WikiLeaks, working with The Guardian in the UK, The New York Times, and Der Spiegel. Then came Edward Snowden in 2013. Once again, The Guardian was at the heart of it with some different partners. However, the scale of this collaboration over the HSBC story, the number of news outlets and journalists involved, is unprecedented. It is an extraordinary moment in, uh, is, from a journalistic perspective, both from the substance of what they were able to obtain, the explosive nature of some of the documents that they were able to publish, and also the, the, the scope and the extent of the amount of material that they've obtained and been able to sort through. The document dump, even pertaining to India, had thousands of pages, so it is phenomenal amount of uh, information that we have got. We built a virtual newsroom of uh, all of these reporters around the world. And we also built uh, encrypted uh, systems to allow them to look at all of the documents um, from their laptops or from home or from their offices. So we're all um, basically working together. This is a complicated story that took years to fully break. In 2007, an IT specialist at HSBC's Swiss bank in Geneva, Hervé Falciani, hacked into customer files and fled the country with Swiss authorities giving chase. He was arrested in France and faced a possible extradition until the French authorities realized what he had, evidence that could identify thousands of French tax evaders. Falciani was put under police protection and by 2010, part of the story came out when France informed governments in Greece, Spain, and the US, among others, of the names of tax dodgers in those countries. Arrests were made, but prosecutions were few, and the reporting limited. That all changed last year, when, according to the director of Le Monde in Paris, a second source came forward and handed the paper more data on as many as 100,000 HSBC account holders in Switzerland. That's when Le Monde called in the journalists at the International Consortium, the ICIJ. This was a large journalistic endeavor at the ICIJ that took five months. There was no way we could have done the necessary investigative journalism in the time that we had. 
we needed to provide readers with the right information, which required verifying the data and sorting the clients into those who held accounts legally, those who had violated the law but who had rectified the situation, and those who were the focus of legal proceedings. Initially, we were um, actually told by the bank that we had no right to this material, and they actually asked us to destroy the material, uh, which of course we didn't. Uh, but once we presented the bank with the results of the reporting, they became a bit more conciliatory and they issued a, a huge, very, very, very long four-page statement saying that all these problems had been in the past. In terms of reaction, what has surprised me most is it's not just Britain and the US where this is resonating. It's resonated very, very strongly in Asia, particularly in India, where this whole issue of, of so-called black money has become a very, very, very big issue. 40-odd countries were uh, involved, journalists from 40-odd countries, including Le Monde, of course, and, you know, The Guardian, BBC in, uh, in London. There was continuous exchange of mails about, you know, what this dump pertains to in each of these geographies, figuring out how to translate such, because, you know, most of it was in French, you know, thousands of documents which were exchanged through a very secured network to ensure that such information is not leaked outside. This is really part of the brave, brave new world of journalism. Back in the day when I was getting started in the 80s and 90s, news organizations were very competitive and fiercely independent. They wanted first the credit for the stories for themselves. Here, it's the sort of a conceptual leap where ICIJ uh, has sort of pioneered this idea to uh, basically create an infrastructure of international news organizations around the world, and that sort of expands their capacity to do, to do great work. Another way to look at collaborations is not as an expansion of journalistic capacity, but the re-establishment of capacity that's been lost. News organizations are shrinking. They have fewer reporters and resources to devote to investigations. One of the ironies in the Swiss leak story is that the same digital technology that has demolished the economic model of mainstream news outlets still struggling to monetize their new platforms has allowed them to build virtual newsrooms they share with other outlets, pitting their diminishing resources together to do the kind of work they used to do alone. And strength in numbers is paramount when investigating financial institutions, the likes and scale of which the world has never seen before. One stat I use that was eye-opening to me when I saw it was that um, back in the mid-90s, Morgan Stanley, the, the, the investment bank, was uh, essentially the same size in terms of market capitalization as Dow Jones, the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. You fast forward to today, and you take organizations, say for instance, Goldman Sachs is now 50 times bigger than the New York Times company. So there's been this dramatic shift and power imbalance between media companies and, and these institutions. And it does have actually an impact on and just the power relationship between these two sectors. And those two sectors can intersect at the highest levels. One of Le Monde's owners, Mathieu Pigas, heads the Lazard Investment Bank in Paris. He criticized the newspaper for what he called a form of fiscal McCarthyism and informing. Another co-owner, Pierre Berger, who made his money in fashion through Yves Saint Laurent, also accused the paper of informing on the bank's clients. As Roy Greenslade put it in The Guardian, one of the papers that partnered with Le Monde on the Swiss leaks, the reason that people own newspapers, especially loss-making newspapers, is all about having influence over editorial content. And one key part of that influence is to ensure that their mates, the wealthy elite, are protected from scrutiny. However, scrutiny is what is happening, not only for those who hide their money, often illegally, in HSBC's Swiss bank, but on the bank itself and the shadowy world in which it operates. The whole product that has been sold by the offshore world is secrecy. That's what it sells. And it's the secrecy that actually allows wrongdoing. I mean, you might say that um, uh, most of what's happening offshore is perfectly legal, and it is, but it's the secrecy that allows some of it to be illegal and some of it to be wrong. Um, it's very difficult for journalists to take on this world. I mean, we've taken on this world by creating our own world, basically, a, a world of reporters that all share information in a way that media organizations have never done before. On the download this week, our viewers weigh in on the coverage of the Swiss leaks. 
There's a great deal to admire about the collaboration that's been seen in the HSBC case, and I think that perhaps points as a potential way forward for the industry to look at. If resources are becoming ever more scarce, perhaps collaboration between publications and organisations in different parts of the world is a way forward. Difficulties will be in trying to change journalistic attitudes in terms of sharing information, and also for the owners of the media companies to make sure that they're willing to share some of the glory with their rivals. In reporting on financial institutions generally face challenges that are specific and peculiar to the financial sector. The sector is characterized by a high level of secrecy and opacity. In many cases, the ownership structures of companies are highly complex and difficult to understand. Information on financial operations of companies are difficult to access, and in many cases, journalists have to rely on leaks such as the Lux leaks and the Swiss leaks. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. After 411 days in a Cairo prison, the two remaining Al Jazeera journalists are now no longer behind bars, at least for the moment. Producers Bahar Mohammed and Mohammed Fahmi attended a retrial hearing this past Thursday, which did not start promisingly. The judge began by calling on Peter Gresta, the one AJE journalist already released and deported two weeks ago. Fahmi then asked the judge why Gresta alone had been freed and he unfurled an Egyptian flag saying that he had been forced by security officials to give up his Egyptian citizenship. A few minutes later, both defendants were released on bail, but their retrial reconvenes February 23rd. The Al Jazeera media network called the bail ruling a small step in the right direction, though it does not consider this case closed until the men are acquitted. In the world of television news in the U.S., where the anchor person is king, one of the biggest names in the business has fallen over a lie that's finally caught up with him. Brian Williams, the host of NBC's Nightly News, has been telling a story over the past 10 years or so about his time in Iraq. Brian, tell us about what you got yourself into. Well, in the end, Tom... It... Initially, he reported on an incident in 2003 in which a U.S. military helicopter flying ahead of his was hit by ground fire. But over the years, Williams' story changed. Uh, two of our four helicopters were hit by ground fire, including the one I was in. No kidding. Uh, in retellings on talk shows and even on his own broadcast, Williams said that the aircraft that was hit was his own. The lie was called out by soldiers who had been with Williams during that reporting mission in 2003. It grew into a scandal that damaged the anchor's credibility as well as his networks. In a quasi-apology, Williams said that he had, quote, misremembered. He took himself off the air for a few nights, and following what NBC called an internal investigation, he was suspended for six months without pay for what his employers called inexcusable actions. The suspension is seen as NBC's attempt to save the career of its best-known figure, which appears in doubt given what has been written about the trust factor. And social media was alive with commentators making the point that of all of the lies told on the American airwaves over Iraq, the tales of WMDs, the prospect of mushroom clouds, Williams's simply does not compare. There's a new player in the war against ISIL or ISIS. We don't know the names of those involved, just that of their organization. Anonymous. The international cyber activist group put a video online claiming that it has targeted and taken down numerous Twitter accounts of what it called ISIL operatives who use social media to recruit new fighters. ISIS, we will hunt you, take down your sites, accounts, emails, and expose you. From now on, no safe place for you online. You will be treated like a virus, and we are the cure. Anonymous also included Facebook links to 12 other users who it claims to have close ties to the movement. It's the group's first foray into the war on ISIL. In the past, it's gone after government websites in Israel and Turkey, among others. And last year, it targeted the Ku Klux Klan in the U.S. over the white supremacist group's position on racial strife in Ferguson, Missouri. In the news business, speed is considered an essential ingredient. Journalists are under pressure to get the story quickly. Better yet, get it first. And it's not just TV. Newspaper reporters have always been under the gun to break news before their competition does. These days, with all kinds of news outlets, live blogging events, the chances of getting something wrong are high. There's a journalistic movement underway that's out to change all that, or at least to give news junkies something different. It's called slow journalism. And the idea is to give reporters the time they require to investigate news events and seek out untold stories and angles. 
This movement values meaning over mere information. A growing number of organizations have embraced the concept and their output takes various forms. Lengthy articles that take months to publish or podcasts, like Serial, which grew into an online phenomenon by taking a news story that had been reported before but needed further examination. Journalism has been called covering history on the run. The Listening Post's Paolo Ganino now on the movement that's out to slow things down to a crawl. Early January, panic in Paris after the Charlie Hebdo attack. The media were scrambling for information, and some of what got said was less fact, more hearsay. A wild speculation out there. In July 2014, when flight MH17 was shot out of the skies over Ukraine, news outlets jostled to break the news about who was behind it. For days, conflicting details were being reported. And in the early coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013, there was little more than speculation. The mainstream media and actually really respected news outlets put out uh, unconfirmed information about the bombers and their identity uh, at a time when they really weren't sure who they were and they gave wrong names and wrong information spread like wildfire on Twitter and, and everywhere. People were um, tapping into police radio, they were tweeting far too fast, they were using social media and they were getting it wrong. And then the journalists were following the tweets and they were getting it wrong. We see the effect that speed is having on journalism every day. I just feel like we've stopped noticing. In today's climate, being first to a story is far more important than being right. It's not just TV that's reporting in a hurry. The internet and social media have accelerated the pace of news. And part of the problem is us, news consumers. We've grown addicted to surfing, news snacking, and listicles rather than long-form reporting. We expect, even demand, instant gratification, reducing the space and time for journalism that thinks. This need for information so quickly I think a lot of us are questioning whether this is really important. You know, how early do we need our news? There is an alternative school of journalism, a breakaway group of reporters, writers and editors who have hit the brakes and slowed it right down. The space-filling exercise as what uh, many journalists would call uh, a maddening race for um, stories, in many cases pointless stories, rehashing press releases, no originality in the reporting, uh, just dependent on one source. Those kind of excuses cannot happen in slow journalism. It just gives time, more time for everything, for reporting, for editing, for fact-checking, all those things. So it's kind of like a bit of a counter-movement for, for all the sort of, you know, click this and look at the pictures kind of journalism, which people are really fed up with. The slow journalism movement is growing. In 2013, the correspondent in the Netherlands launched, planning it said to tell stories that do not conform to what is normally understood to be news. The magazine raised $1.7 million through crowdfunding. With the London-based quarterly delayed gratification, the clue is in the name. It waits three months before reporting on a news event and it waited a full five months before reporting on the downing of flight MH17. The model? Go back to the journalists who covered the story and ask them to investigate in depth. In the US, Serial made podcasting history telling the backstory of a murder committed in Baltimore 16 years ago. The podcast topped the charts on iTunes. Retro Report, whose content is distributed by the New York Times, looks back in history to report new, previously unknown details about past news events. And in Finland, Long Play publishes just one long-form article per month. They call them e-singles. We can actually spend years on a story. You can look into stories that were perhaps in the news for quite a while at some point, but then after that they were neglected and there might have been angles that nobody really looked into because the attention of the news media had already moved elsewhere. We returned to the scene of the Soma mining disaster in Turkey. This was a, a story that was a huge 
huge for a couple of days, but then did fa fall off the news agenda pretty much worldwide. We sent journalists back to the, to the town, uh, and she found lots more stories behind the stories. It's about the politics of it, about the funding, about the disinvestment in safety in the Turkish mining industry. We just think that you need to bring more to your diet than purely fast food. There has to be an alternative. The biggest challenge on professional journalists is to offer something more and that means we have to do our homework much better. We, we probably have to be slow in many cases where we can afford to be slow and then offer much more in terms of analysis, in terms of offering facets, in terms of offering context to information. But in an industry where news outlets are trying to do more with less, slow journalism can be expensive and challenging for fundraising. The Dutch The Correspondent relies on readers paying 60 euros a year. It has 30,000 subscribers. Finland's long play charges nearly 5 euros per article and survives with a grant from a foundation supporting journalistic innovation. And slow journalism is attracting some journalistic heavyweights. Former New York Times editor Jill Abramson is launching a new outlet and says he will pay reporters an average of $100,000 for long-form investigative stories. We're really excited by what people like Jill Abramson can bring to the movement. We really welcome the more and more investment in journalism. It's calling out for it, it's crying out for it. We need that kind of investment. What she's bringing to the table I think is really, really potent and really powerful. She's sending out a clear message that Journalism is important and journalism needs to be funded correctly and properly. Every journalist's dream would be to spend months on a story or a year on a story and make that kind of money. Slow journalism is going to make us question what news is and what journalism is. I think it's going to help us extend our definition of journalism so that it's not just about breaking news, it's not just about the new, it might actually be about the old. It might be a new interpretation on the old, which is going to help us, I think, become better citizens by getting understanding and wisdom rather than just a whole lot of new stuff that may not be right. Sometimes we need a minute to digest what we've been fed. The slow journalism movement wants to give you that time. What you do with it, whether you use it to stop and reflect or to just refresh your Twitter feed, that's up to you. More voices on the download now with their thoughts on slowing journalism down. People love to dismiss magazines like Delayed Gratification as just dumping ground for feature articles. But the fact that they really revel in the slowness of slow journalism really affords their writing this kind of fresh, novel edge. Um, I think ultimately they're able to do what modern journalism can't do or really struggles to do, which is to make news stick and uh, to give it longevity. Uh, and crucially, you're far more likely to remember a story they wrote about migrant workers on the graveyard shift at a London McDonald's than you are, say, a, an immigration statistic from a, a daily newspaper. Journalists are finding more and more ways of getting real-time updates out there. Some are doing it exclusively through social media, and others are using mobile platforms like Snapchat to create temporary news stories. But in the rush to get the latest updates out there, there's one element that tends to get missed out, and that's context. Finally, it's time to slow things down even more with the help of Paul Salopek, who's possibly the slowest journalist of them all. His project is to walk around the world chronicling the people and the landscape, but it's a difficult story to capture in a soundbite or a line of voiceover because this journey, this story, will take him seven years. Salopek is tied in with National Geographic. He's been posting dispatches along the way. He's already been walking a little more than two years now, starting in Ethiopia, crossing the Red Sea, through Saudi Arabia. He's now in Turkey. We're ending our program with a couple of short snippets of his work because it's all we've got time for. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Today we reach the Red Sea ourselves, and uh, it's not so much anticlimax as just a sense of the real scope of the journey.